welcome, ladies, gentlemen, not very powerful, to your Easy Trivia's Game Park for the week of September 2nd. Wow, already September. I am in a new location. It finally looks like an actual room, like, almost like a study, maybe. Uh, there's bookcases, there's books that I can pretend I've read. Um, maybe there's some bourbon in the corner in a decanter, like a proper study of fireplace, c- c- just pouring carbon monoxide into the room as I slowly die. I mean, it really is a very nice environment here. I got art around me. Um, it's suggestive, so I couldn't show it on camera, but it's great. It's great art. I want to thank everyone for tuning in this week. I- I'm actually really excited to start the show, so I think I'm just going to jump in. I don't feel like doing the rigmarole over poor build in the beginning i think i just want to jump in and start talking about games because i've got an itch and i really need to scratch it so how about we get to it not so rapid fire the star wars outlaw is out it's been reviewed metacritic 77 an open critic is also a 77 we're going to be talking about more of the actual issues of this game very soon but actually much lower than i thought it'd be star wars outlaws of course hit game by Ubisoft for the recently came out. Sales seem soft right at the beginning. Doesn't seem like that many people were interested in this game, but of course it's Star Wars. Uh, it could have a long tail, and I'm sure it'll top the charts at the end in love. It just doesn't feel like there was a fervor around this game, but, uh, you know, it's still early. We don't really know how good it's going to do. I'm very curious if... Uh, will this have that tail of a Star Wars game? Of course, you get to the holiday season. Maybe this jumps up uh, in even more sales, but... It doesn't really seem like a lot of people are talking about it. Of course, we have a new story to be talking about that later on that I'm sure everyone's heard about. But other than that, I'm ready to play it. I haven't touched it quite yet. been too busy, but I can't wait to try it out. It doesn't seem great. I heard it. I heard the, the actual beginning is pretty boring, but the more you play it, the actual more you interested in the environment of, of course, I think you're in Tatooine most, if not the whole game. So that environment specifically is apparently very well crafted and built the narrative and the ga- actual game design in the opening areas of the, or I should say the middle areas of the game is actually much better than the beginning would let you on. I haven't heard too much about the narrative, which is strange to me. Now you, Ubisoft, of course, does open world well, so that's what everyone wants to talk about. But is the narrative good in this game? I haven't really heard that much. About the general consensus of is the narrative good, which is why I play the game. So maybe I'm not going to be interested in the game, or maybe it won't hit me as hard as I'm expecting it to. But who knows? Again, we'll be talking more about this later in the show. Concord, of course, is also out. Metacritic 62, Open Critic 65. Not a great showing by Concord. We're going to be talking much, much more in depth in the social. I'm only going to talk very, very lightly on Concord. Speaking very briefly on Concord, though, very soft launch. Um, I I I have no interest in playing it right now. I was never gonna play it. I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say to pretend like I was. Uh, so nothing that came out about the game affected if I was gonna play it or not. I wasn't interested in trying the beta, etc. So, although I have played Hero Shoes before, of course, Overwatch, etc. Um. I don't think this was ever going to pull me, but I, of course, have a full write-up on this later on the show because it's very interesting how this game came out. Moving on. In a press release, Remedy and Annapurna announced a partnership that will both help fund the development of Control 2 and bring both Alan Wake and Control to film and television. This was via an official, like I said, press release. You can view the entire press release on Remedy's, uh, of course, webpage. I found it interesting. I, so I didn't even see, I didn't see this coming specifically with the help of uh, getting funding for Control 2, although that makes sense, of course, Remedy. Um, as a business, you're going to find different ways to, uh, if you don't need to spend your money and you can maybe partnership or get a loan from someone, uh, you're going to look for that. And this seemed like something that it was obvious and something Remedy clearly wants to do. They want to blend live action with their games and I'm sure also have a live action full arm and Annapurna is a perfect partner for that. So I'm sure they will find much success with each other. And this is definitely a scratch your back, I scratch yours. Annapurna gets Alan Wake 2 and Control, which are vibrant worlds for live action. All you have to do is play the game, uh, both games to figure that out. And you get uh, Remedy gets control to finance and future partnerships and cuts and royalties, etc., from the future products of Alan Wake, 
uh, TV show slash film, and of course with Control as well. I do find it interesting if you have been keeping up with Remedy, you know Alan Wake 2 has yet to cross a profit. Not surprising, as that was probably very expensive and also very niche game. Not many people probably even remember Alan Wake 1, uh, and even less people were probably going to be so interested in buying it. Uh, it didn't really feel like it had huge marketing and clearly it didn't work out well even though they tried the Fortnite thing and they tried getting people into the game that way with that um museum-esque thing where you kind of played the first game sort of i think if, if i remember right in Fortnite to try and get you into alan wake uh, it's, just, it's just uh, although i respect the gumption the uh, and they had a partnership with epic to make that happen, of course, and, and remedy, but uh, I don't think the players in Fortnite are gonna be your uh, market for the Alan Wake Two game. So I do feel like that was all wasted money. Although maybe there was a special partnership with Epic to get that to happen, and they didn't have to pay that much. I'm not really sure, of course, but uh, was definitely a head scratcher when I saw it. Definitely, um, as they have not crossed profit yet, uh, is staggering to say at least. But their games do have long tails, control and. Um, their previous games did have long tails. They continually sold well. Maybe Alan Wake 2 will eventually cross the revenue pops if they still have not hit royalties yet, which is, of course, sad to hear because I love Alan Wake 2, but Remedy, I think, is in a safe enough spot where I, they seem confident that they're going to be fine, and I am too. They get to Control 2, I think, will uh, be a big windfall for them as well. And if they have this film and television partnership really expanding, maybe Anna Perman does something unique with that. That will boost them as well. Black Myth Wukong is a giant hit, selling over 10 million copies in under a week, which prompted many Xbox fans to wonder why they skipped their consoles for the launch. And according to the IGN and Forbes, there's a sort of link to them that they are actually an exclusive clause in the game for it to stay on PlayStation and PC. This was both from Sheeple Nick and Jeff Grubb are saying that there is not an exclusivity deal. However, Paul Tassie relays via Twitter that quote, I have a lot of respect for Jeff and Nick. I would not have published without what I considered to be an extremely authoritative source. Fresh ain't not to be able to say more. End quote. Um, oh, I'm sorry. The actual quote continues. The situation has been described to me as a bizarre, which I can certainly agree with at this point. End quote. Right there. Uh, Black Myth Wukong. Not surprising, as if we have been keeping up with the show and just general knowledge, you know that PlayStation specifically has multiple outreach programs inside of their company, right? They have um, the China Hero Project, I think, is is the um, specific program where they go into China specifically. They foster a, uh, you, for lack of a better word, community outreach program to get their games onto PlayStation. They also had one that just released and relaunched that it does the same thing in India, I want to I want to say but uh, with that they have become a very big uh, supporter in the Chinese market that has put them in a position where something like this can happen where they find uh, a diamond in the rough we'll say uh, the, the Black Myth Wukong game it explodes and they essentially have an exclusive on the platform and they're making lots of money of course it is on PC as well but if they can get to these publishers early these developers early foster a relationship foster a scratch back scratch yours hey you sign this agreement you stick with us you get a higher pay cut or whatever that looks like on their end this of course makes so much sense for them as well as i'm sure they're not regretting this agreement they'll get it on xbox eventually uh, but there is only pluses if you look at it from um the developer standpoint with specifically back with wukong as Think about this, right? You, if you go for Xbox, you also have to make sure it runs on Series S, which has clearly backfired on Xbox substantially, but has also helped them a lot. It is very complicated with the Xbox Series S. It is very hard to develop for. One, it is not as strong as where you want it to be. You also have a unique architecture with that system because it is the Xbox platform. It's not as easy as, let's say, going on a PC and uh, making sure it runs on a bunch of graphics cards. Right? It's, 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 it's much harder than that. Uh, we've talked about that a lot of times on the show repeatedly, where it's, it's not like there's a software program where you hit a button and it magically works on Xbox, right? It's going to take time. It takes lots of time to make sure something works. Not only do you have to make something for the Series X, you have to make sure it works on the Series S, which is a completely different uh, 
uh, architecture you have to work for. Make sure you run it differently. Make sure you're utilizing the different ways that that system works. Of course, this is a very layman's version of what you're actually doing with this off. Uh, I apologize with this hardware, but you could definitely, definitely see it from developer sides. Why would you release on Xbox? You have so many negatives, and PlayStation was already there in the beginning, already there promising X, Y, Z. You have a publishing agreement in front of you. Hey. All you got to do is stay on our platform. Screw the other guys. Easy signature for me, at least. I don't see why you wouldn't. Moving on. Oh, and also, props to Black Myth Wukong. Props to the developers. The review thing, um, I want to quickly touch on, because that was a bit of a of a interesting thing that came out of Black Myth Wukong. Um, sorry, it's actually doing uh, very well as well. But uh, I do want to say, first off, 10 million copies. Incredible for just a... Just, pretty much their first outing for a game like this right they have not made uh a a game quite up to the snuff like this and it has exploded for them happy for them um i wanted to say quickly though um it quickly made headlines that the their review guidelines was released and uh it was quite strange to say the least it referenced if you were to the get the early game, part of the embargo was you couldn't mention any feminism or feminist propaganda. You couldn't mention COVID. Now, and there's a bunch of things you can find a full list online. I don't think there's too much here to fully dissect. Um, one, uh, you, uh, everyone listening to the show knows my stance on the Chinese Communist Party. You understand my stance on Tencent, which all this comes into part when you're talking about Black Myth Wukong. If you look at the uh, things leading up to this none of the things you are reading on the guidelines is shocking at all uh, especially given the context of when it was out uh, the the full range of the politics involved in china specifically uh, you could just look at their uh, social programming or their social uh, uh, we'll say culture uh, and none of that is surprising to me at least i would interested if it's surprising to anyone else out there um it's i was actually more surprised that people were shocked that something like this would happen uh from a someone from the chinese communist party run by tencent and etc uh but hey you know i understand not everyone knows uh the ins and outs of the chinese uh, political parties but uh, i will implore people to read and make your decision if you'd like to play this game, or maybe that affects your opinion on this or something. But um, obviously, very strange that you have you feel the need to point out that there can't be feminist propaganda in a review. Don't know why you would even feel the need to put that out there. What what would what is about this game that makes you feel that? And then when I hear "Don't do something," it just makes you want to talk about it way more. So I don't know what they were trying to do. It's not like China is anti women or something. So it's even more strange when you coming at that covid obvious reason why i don't want to talk about that um i don't even think i need to say why <laughs> i think everyone listening to this knows why they wouldn't want to talk about it uh, but everything else was a bit strange maybe they have a warped perception of the west in how we talk about culture and politics in both reviews and games and things and when blame them uh, a lot of people really don't know how to have conversations uh in specific video game spaces and in specific outlets of course uh, so maybe that is what made them feel like they had to make th this thing, but eh, I don't know. I already spent too long talking about this, I feel. Let's move on to another Chinese company, NetEase. They have cut quite a bit of jobs over at the um, Ooka studio in Japan. This is via Bloomberg's ta uh, Takashi Mochizuki. According to the reporting, they plan to close the studio soon. Ooka Studios did just release the Visions of Mana game with Square Enix of um, on August 29th of this year. So they are just fresh off a of game and they're immediately getting axed. Um, NetEase and Tencent are, as far as I'm understanding, pulling back on their, let's call it the outer circle of their development. They're not as important. Uh, parts of their studios i think that is important to bring up and uh with china kind of tightening the uh, grip they have on allowing their population especially um i believe minors in these uh play video games freely of course they have time limits and uh like and it's government regulated so it's very serious you cannot cross them when you uh, when you put all that together and you look at Nettie's intensity kind of pulling back. It all it makes a lot more sense why they would uh, kind of cut these. They have other avenues. I remember Nettie's has this um, huge game right now. I forget some silly name, 
Um, yeah, well, it sounds silly in English. I'm, I'm sure it sounds fine in China, Chinese, but uh, it, it is quite uh, quite funny. I can't quite remember, but they have a giant mobile game over there right now. I'm sure they are cutting some of the quote-unquote fat. Of course, these are people with jobs. I'm not making a line of that, but they are cutting the fat to probably allocate resources elsewhere, elsewhere to ensure that what the making their money uh, keeps making the money. Of course, Visions of Mana, unfortunately are not the money makers, although I wish it was. Incredibly upsetting news, as for early access PS5 players of Star Wars Outlaws have been notified of a potential save-killing bug that was introduced in the latest patch, and Ubisoft is urging fans to restart their progress. This could kill many hours of the game for anyone who had bought the game already, and unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be a solution. Ubisoft did promise, however, to give all players an in-game shop trinket. Uh, 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 for their ship and a hundred Ubisoft connect points, which is barely better than just giving them nothing. I literally have that written down in my docket here. I am puzzled by this one. You are hurting your most dedicated fans by not figuring out a solution for this. Um, if I, as far as I understand, it's $110 USD to play this game early. So you are, I mean, showing them the middle finger, essentially, and killing their saves with whatever this update that needed to happen. Um, I'm very curious what this update does that kills saves so badly to the point where they're saying you have to delete your save and restart the game because you will eventually have your save killed. So I'm very curious what that is. Maybe it has something to do with the internal um, checkpointing system. Maybe it has something to do with how the save overwrites the previous save. Um, I'm not really sure if this update fixed the problem. Imagine what the the update was fixing if this was the solution. Uh, I I'm I'm picturing something was even worse, and this is to, like to fix that, so it's not nearly as bad. I'm curious what that maybe could have been, or maybe this was just a big mix up by um, one of their engineering teams, and it completely uh, jacked everything up. I'm sure someone is getting fired for this, but very sad to hear your most dedicated fans and also what a horrible way to treat them right your ubisoft you the best thing you could do is an in-game trinket some people uh and again these are your hardcore fans you're treating the most hardcore the people who spent the most money with you and spent the most time with you the moment they could um you immediately say hey all the time you spent on the game you are now losing replay it by the way we're gonna give you an in-game ship trinket and a hundred ubisoft connect points you, I, I honestly, and I mean this seriously, I think it would have been better giving you nothing than doing that seems so insulting <laughs> to give you that and act like that is worth the trade off. If I had 10, even 10, I don't even say five hours in the game and this was your solution, I'd be like, what? What is this? What is, what is, I, I, I do really frankly believe it is worse than just doing Nothing that might have actually been a bit better and just just a sincere apology. <laughs> uh, moving on. Personal favorite, my game's done quick. The beloved speedrunning event for charity is now owned by the director of operations, Matt Murkoff, the founder stepped down late last year. Um, and this is via Sophie McEvy at gamesindustry.biz. Uh, this was a quick story, quick write-up over there. I did want to just quickly highlight it as I love games done quick so much. So I did want to just... Quickly give them a shout out. We did cover uh, the founder stepping down uh, late last year, if memory serves. Um, pretty sure I did cover that and uh, find it quite interesting. I love Games Done Quick. Hopefully, it keeps doing what it's doing. I, I, oh my God, I love just watching these speedruns because it's so fascinating. You learn so much about the game. You learn about all these tips and tricks, and they tell you, hey, we found this thing because of X, Y, and Z. And you get to learn a lot as you're watching one of you, you know a game that you like get beaten in ten minutes, fifteen minutes, twenty minutes. Some games, well, some of my favorite ones, um, uh, actually are glitchless ones because I don't love the glitch ones where it's like, oh, you know, there's this wall, you run through it, you skip half the game. It's like, okay, well, that's cool, that's cool, and I'm glad it exists. Don't get me wrong, but I like the impressive feat of, hey, this is glitchless or near glitchless, where it's like, no, you know, we do like two or three glitches where it's like. Eh, okay, I'll take that. But full glitches runs very satisfying. Dark Souls, one, two, three, any of them. Shout out to you for glitches runs. Those are very fun. Next up, this is very quick because I don't care about it. Call of Duty Next is happening, right? 
I think it's actually finished up right about now. Uh, if you want a full detailed look at Black Ops 6's multiplayer Warzone and Zombies, you can, of course, tune in and find out all of that. Um, it is quite hilarious. I'm sure everyone has been catching up on this on my Twitter pages, everything. Um, I keep being shown the... <laughs> so, if you haven't been caught up, the recent Call of Duty multiplayer will feature a... What would you call it? Like a... Uh, it's not like a bodyguard, but a, a bullet sponge, I guess. Uh, you grab someone from behind and you shield yourself with their body. But, but when you do this in multiplayer, and of course you're in game chat. So if you are in game chat and your enemy is in game chat and you grab the person from behind, you will then be able to talk to the person you have wrapped around you. So you can have dialogue with this person you have now captured. Um, and picture the worst things being said in a call of duty match and that is the twitter clips i am seeing daily at this point hilarious quite hilarious to uh find myself in a situation where call of duty feels like it is in 2011 again and they're just saying horrible horrible things to each other and it is so funny everyone should take the time today go check out a clip it is very funny incredibly inappropriate beware beware this is a quick one i found um and i did not have time to do a write-up so i did want to take a second to discuss this this is a very important figure in capcom he is leaving this is hidaki itsune he has been with capcom for 30 years and he is actually leaving the company this is a big deal so i did want to read his statement of course uh and pay this man some respect so quote I have an announcement for all my followers. This is, of course, on his Twitter page. At the end of August 2024, I'll be leaving Capcom after 30 years and five months. Thank you for your long-term support of the games and characters I've been responsible for. Excuse me. And I hope you will continue to support Capcom's games and characters from September. I will start developing a new game and in a new environment. I hope to create fun, beautiful games that are as memorable as, or even more memorable, than the ones I have created so far. Please stay tuned for my next creation. Signed his name, of course. This is just an important figure. I, I felt like uh, deserved a spot in the show to discuss. Let's let's get this gentleman's Moby Games really quick to really remind ourselves how influential this guy was. Hidetaka Itsune. And of course, anyone at Capcom, you reach that level. And you're going to be someone that is known throughout the industry. And especially uh, someone that is... I mean, looked up to this guy. Uh, let's go. So, Dragon's Dogma 2 director, of course. D Devil May Cry 5 special edition director. Let's go all the way to some of his first directing gigs with Devil May Cry 3 special edition. Um, Devil May Cry 4 is something that is near and dear to my heart. And, of course, Super Street Fighter 4 as well is another big one. Of course, the original Dragon's Dogma. Uh, and then you could go on very big in DMC. Of course, uh, I would say even the leading charge of that since uh near since the creation of the game and he will of course be missed at capcom but uh let's move on to what have you been playing now of course as i mentioned i haven't been playing too much recently so this is going to be kind of a light thing i have not really this isn't going to be what you've been playing i'm actually just going to be talking about what i've been watching and i've been watching twilight zone and i need everyone to take a second today sit down I'll wait. Okay, you're sitting. Thank you. Take a second. Either buy a season of the Twilight Zone or, you know, whatever, Amazon. I don't care where you get it. Or you go to this Paramount Plus thing. I don't have this. I've been mooching off a friend. Um, well, I've been house-sitting, actually. And, my God, Twilight Zone is so good. It is so good i watched you know everyone's got a, an assignment today go watch 22 i think it is it's like season two episode 12 or something like that and it's just called 22 i think great great episode fantastic there's a lot of good ones um but that is a special one there's a lot of special ones but i and i love twilight zone i'm biased of course but take the time watch twilight zone learn your sci-fi learn where all these things came from right well actually we just talked about only two in control earlier you want to talk about ripoffs you want to talk about giant ripoffs you 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 looked for twilight zone 
you watch Twilight Zone, and then you realize, oh, this is where everyone got their ideas for everything, almost like verbatim. You'll be like, oh, this is where this came from. This is where this came. Wow. And you have to remind yourself what time frame and what time period all this was made. And it becomes so fascinating when you realize, wow, this was like 70 years ago, 60 years ago, whatever it was, right? And you remind yourself, wow, this feels like it can almost be made today with some of these um, episodes. And when you really dissect what they're actually about, you're like, wow. It's like they could tell the future. Maybe we're in the episode of Twilight Zone. Who knows? But um, I'm done talking about the Twilight Zone. I will now move on because I want to talk about news. Rumor roundup. Bill Bill Coon. Quite the name, right? Someone we haven't said in a while, but whenever we bring this gentleman up, he is always worth bringing up Bill Bill Coon, a well-known leaker who gets it right many times and is so trusted that many people will take him straight up on his word on whatever he says. And this is one of those occasions. So he has revealed the name of the rumored PS5 Pro and released an illustration of it. Now, I found this original story on VGC, but just as a reminder, and I hope I get this right, Bill Bill Coon runs another site. It's called like Video Game Deals or something like that. I'm sorry. I do not remember. But it's something like that. That is where uh, Bill Bakun, I believe, posted it. He, I believe they also posted it on Twitter. But, of course, VGC had, did the write-up. This is where I'm pulling the information, as well as I, of course, collaborated and made sure everything was true. Uh, Bill Bakun said the, uh, the unit will be called the PS5 Pro. I know, shocking to everyone listening to this right now. And it will be announced, quote, very soon, end quote, around the first half of September. They do have access to the package design, but they cannot share the copyrighted image. So they just made an illustration of it and that you can ease. <coughs> excuse me. And you can easily find this online. So this is interesting, right? They have the packaging. Uh, clearly, this thing has been manufactured probably for, I don't know, at least since the beginning of August, I assume, because uh, this thing has to be out on shelves by the end of this year. So I imagine they already have a few, I don't know, Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of units by now. I, I, I really don't know. But they have the package design, right? They have a picture of it. But they were afraid of posting it because, you know, obviously Sony would come after them with their lawyers and these things. Um, and they didn't want to get caught with it. So they quite literally sketched a design of this thing. Uh, I actually have it pulled up here. I'm not going to be showing this on air. One, because it's annoying. Two, you can just look it up. Uh, it's... Quite literally, not impressive at all. I got to be honest. It's not even worth the effort of me showing it to you. If you really are curious, you can look this up. It straight up just looks like a PS5 Slim. Uh, and the only difference I can tell is there are three lines on the sides versus the one line from the Slim. Uh, but it quite literally looks the exact same. Um, the So, of course, it's hard to get. It's literally a sketched, not MS Paint. It's much nicer than that. But, you know, like, it is a illustration, you know. You're not really getting perspective. So I don't know how big this thing is. But it looks very small from the picture. I'm not really sure what's going on uh, with that. I wish there was some sort of scaling. Or maybe if he knew the dimensions, he could maybe tell us the dimensions. Maybe he does not know that. Um, but I would not want to know the size of this thing. It does have the flared kind of thing going to the top that's very questionable looking. Don't love that. It pretty much looks like the same thing, which I, I get it. You want to you want to follow a design story, right? When you're making something like this, right? You you don't want to make something that looks completely different. But this thing does straight up just look like a PS5. I hope it would look a little different. Um, to be fair though, I did love the PS4 Pro design, and it literally just looked like like if you if you had a sandwich. And you're like, you know what? This needs another piece of bread. And you just threw a, another piece of bread on top of it. And you just made it like a triple decker now. Right? So that's just what it looked like. So I'm coming from very small ground. But I thought that looked so beautiful in its simplicity. I'm a big fan of hardware that looks simple. Minimalistic. Does not draw attention. Because I don't want it to draw attention in my entertainment center. Do you understand what I'm saying out there? Everyone. Achievers, etc. Do you understand? Like, I don't want this giant thing 
jutting out or distracting looking in these things. And, you know, I, that's all I want. And the PS5 is not very good at that because it is very distracting. One, it's hideous. It's, it's I mean, it's hideous. I don't care that it's hideous. I, I don't really care that much. I, I'm I buy the thing. I put it in the, the entertainment center where it fits, right? I don't really care that it doesn't look good. I'm just saying, as a negative, it doesn't look great. PS5 Pro looks like the same. But maybe it's smaller. Maybe you can hide it better. I'm hoping for black. Because, you know, you can hide black, you know? I want, I want to almost forget that the system is even there. Do you understand? And then I just staring at this TV screen, this beautiful TV screen. And I'm just transported. I don't want to care. I don't want to think about the system. I don't want it to to be glowing or or giant, you know, giant red ones. There there is beauty in simplicity. Let's leave it at that. Rumors ran around today that there is a Batman game set in the Batman universe from Puck News. A very questionable source, to say the least, I'd say. However, James Good, the head of DC Universe himself, personally came out and refuted the claims. Um, and he said this via a reply on threads, by the way. Did not know, frankly, anyone used threads, which is, if you don't know, Instagram's version of Twitter, pretty much. Did not know anyone used that, but James Gunn does, I guess. Uh, and it says, quote, sadly, there is no truth to this whatsoever end quote of course that is a reply to them just asking is this real and that was a picture of this now it's up to you if you believe james Gunn or not i'm not gonna sit here and pretend like i've heard of puck news i'm not gonna sit here and pretend like i trust them or anything like that they just it, it straight up just seemed like they just said something no citing no i heard from this i i i have valuable and they just said there's a game in the batman universe and people just kind of Ran with it. I did. I didn't really believe it because, it, again, it was from Puck News. Don't know who these people are. Uh, when you do something like this, you really, you know, you re you start recognizing names in these things, and there's one that stood out. Like, who is this? Why do we care about what they're saying? It didn't get that much traction. I'm being honest. Um, now, if a Puck News comes out and IGN makes a story, or, you know, kind of collaborating. Okay. 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 You know, but if if all we got is puck news, maybe we should tell them to shut the fuck up, right? Maybe they're shut the fuck up news or something. I don't know about that. There's a joke in there somewhere. Someone smarter than me, please write in to the show and tell me what would have been better. Let's start the show for the week. Yes, that's right. We're starting the actual show like an hour in, like 35 minutes, something like that. It's a long one. Strap in Bungie, acclaimed developer of the Destiny franchise, and of course the original Halo games, has been in much of the news in the past few years for many reasons. Some good, but even more bad. And unfortunately for them, it's yet another bad day, as Jason Schreier via Bloomberg has reported that Chris Barrett, sometimes referred as Christopher Barrett, uh, in the credits or whatnot, uh, was formerly director of the upcoming Extraction Shooter Marathon, um, had left the company back in this march um oh i should specifically say his position was replaced in march and his firing was somewhere around spring i imagine those two are the same date but let's go back into the write-up we'll, we'll start for who left the company this march was fired after an internal investigation concluded that barrett made at least eight female employees uncomfortable at work the investigation found that Barrett called lower-level female employees attractive and remarked on their looks in the workplace, asked them to play truth or dare, and heavily implied that his high standing in the company could help them in their careers. The previous comments were made from two people familiar with the investigation. When reached out to comment, Chris Barrett said the following to Bloomberg, quote, I feel that I have always conducted myself with integrity and have been respectful and supportive of my colleagues, many of whom I considered my closest friends. I never understood my communications to be unwanted, and I never would have thought they could be possibly have made anyone feel uncomfortable. If anyone ever felt that way about their interaction with me, I am truly sorry. End quote. This, this story follows years 
of multiple stories of Bungie's quote-unquote bro culture that was fostered through many years, but has apparently improved in the recent years, although this story would lead many to believe otherwise. Sony purchased them in 2022 for $3.6 billion, but since that purchase, the company has been seen as a huge fail, as clearly Bungie was in a horrible place prior to the purchase and have seen layoffs of over 200 people this year and about 200 people the year prior. Oh my God, we have much to talk about the spongy story, right? So I'm going to stick to the meat and potatoes with Christopher Barrett, and then I'll give my overall thoughts with how Bungie is clearly falling apart before our eyes. So clearly, uh, this person conducted themselves uh, in a manner which is, one, unbecoming of anyone in a high position and an executive level talking to anyone lower than them. Second, a uh, fucking creep. May maybe you, you could get, play devil's advocate and a couple of these things aren't too bad, but this dude sounds like a, frankly, um, like prepubescent man asking people to play truth or dare. What is this? What is this? So glad that he is out of here. Um, unfortunately, in his situation, he's been in the company uh i think since myth two or something like that i I did a little moby game search on this gentleman to learn more about him uh he's a long director he is many times over a millionaire uh so this guy is fine uh so he made out like a bandit frankly uh and now he did lose all his vestige because he got fired prior to um and if you don't know what that means uh when the sony purchase happened a lot of their payments were made in stock. You had to wait a certain amount of time before you could invest your shares and you could sell them off and make that money. Uh, we were talking tens of millions of dollars, I'm pretty sure, um, that he probably missed out on. Uh, so good. Uh, I am. I maybe would have pause if it was one or two because you're like, okay, well, it's kind of he shit. He said, unfortunately, we don't know the circumstance, but eight female employees, again, at least eight, that's just the people who said something, right? I did see. I won't say the name of this creator because I don't know if they want it out there that much. Uh, but a creator that I know of mentioned that the reason they actually stopped playing Destiny as a content creator was because this gentleman made them uncomfortable at a meeting and kept texting them afterwards. So now we're at nine. This this dude is a creep, frankly. Um, I would, would like to remind people that uh, there are many people in the video games industry that are weirdos. Uh, you know, I think it's easy to forget um, people in tech can be weird. And uh, I think uh, this is, of course, on the extreme end of the weird. But let's not forget that uh, a lot of these people is a computer and they don't know how to talk to women in these things. I think this is a, a very perfect example of someone who does not know uh how to conduct themselves in a way that is not disgusting. Uh, and uh, this gentleman should be ashamed of him. I'm glad he's out of there. Uh, it's not hard to not make people feel uncomfortable. But finished up with the Chris Ferret, let's talk about Bungie. Bungie is in a free-for-all, frankly. Um, I think they uh, are being eaten away at. Uh, it's clear that Sony will have full control over the company very soon. Uh, they, I don't know why Sony bought them now. I thought it was actually a very wise purchase in the beginning. I thought it made a lot of sense. It gave them a lot of backing of the one thing they were not good at, which is games as a service titles. That was the one thing that Sony didn't really know what to do with. How do we nail multiplayer? What do we do with multiplayer shooters? How do we make them good? That is the one area that they didn't nail. They know how to do adventure games. They 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 are the place for third person action adventure games, period. And I thought it was a very wise purchase back in twenty twenty two. You you grab Bungie, you make them a Sony studio. You use their expertise to your advantage. You learn from them. You use that to make other games, and then you get to cut the profits, their revenue from them to yourself. To then bolster yourself in another way, you eventually make that money back and through Destiny, through their upcoming games. I'm sure they saw things that were impressive. Now, given hindsight, given what we see now, um, it's clear that they were tricked in some way. I don't know how. You do not lose multiple quarters. I mean, let's not forget, this is the same company, Bungie, of course. 
that reported a 55% profit miss on a target. That is enough to wipe out, I would say, over 60% of companies. If you miss a quarter by 55%, that is how much you miss your profit that you need to pay your bills, bond, not bonds, I apologize, your bills, your loans, and these things. You're looking, if they weren't purchased, it easily, they easily could have been insolvent. There are multiple things you can look up and figure out that this once prestigious company is clearly spent way too much money way too fast and do not know how to make multiple games at once that is something that they have known since activision this is an old activision complaint actually there were multiple executives at the time that stated in public that they were not good at making multiple games and that was one thing that they uh were worried about them and they did not want to cut them into other games or allow them to make other games is because they didn't believe they could do it well, 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 clearly they were right. They, if you look at the Destiny history, they cut uh, Destiny about three years ago ish, and they go to make Marathon. Marathon is their PvP game. They need PvP team to make that. What do they do? They slice every good person off of their PvP team. They completely sacrifice that part of the game and that player base. Their PvP is completely essentially in stasis. For that three to five years. So there's a whole subset of that community. That was not helped at all. For three to four years. And I would argue. There is clearly no avenue. For the, for them to be serviced at all. So they were just kind of left. While they went to make Marathon. They did not know how to juggle. These two projects. Let alone the four. That they were trying to get going at one point. Um, there was the cancelled. Um, we've learned a lot about. Of course that cancelled gotcha game that they're working on where you would play as destiny heroes and then you would pay money it, it read just like a gotcha game like the um genshin impacts and these things thank god that thing does not exist it sounds horrible um this would have been destiny um what was the code name it, un, not unimportant right now but uh and they uh and let's not forget they they cut from that layoffs when Sony did the 200 layoff, they cut some of them and are making a new studio with a new game, which would have been um, codenamed Gummy Bears. Uh, I guess they saw promise in that. But let's not forget, uh, this this was clearly, clearly an unforeseen error. They did not need to purchase this. I'm sure everyone involved regrets buying them uh, that had made that decision. Wouldn't be shocked if that's why Jim Ryan. Um, I don't think he was fired. I do think he was let go without contract renewal or something like that. Something to where it was like, you're not fired, but we're not hiring you again or we're not renewing you or something like that because he, for all the good Jim did, which he did a incredible job with the PS5 launch, right? Having a successful console launch like that inside of a pandemic where it was hard to get anything out, let alone a, something as as easily to forget about it as a video game console on shipping containers and these things, was able to make and make and make consoles and get them shipped and bought at the same time. That was That's very impressive. If you think logistically how complicated that is, that's very impressive. But for all the good he did, you have this to look at. $3.6 billion. Sony cannot... Waste of money like that. They are not Microsoft. They do not have capital like that. I think that was cash plus stock. So I don't think they had to get anything out for that. I can't quite remember. I apologize. I don't have that on the top of my head. But regardless, they don't have money to waste like that. They have not made money since that purchase. Clearly, they have not made money since that purchase. They have been eating away at Sony's pockets because they can't pay both their cost to run there so they're they're uh uh they they can't pay their their loans clearly uh as well as running their studio because if they could they wouldn't have laid off almost a third of their people at this point uh because they were at 1100 ish a few years ago like two two three years and they've laid off about 300 of those people by now um they grew way too big way too fast they got a giant studio i think in california can't really remember but they got a giant new studio and wow cost of uh running their studios with all this other if they did not have the capital to do all that at once 
Uh, imagine if they did not get purchased. Much, much worse for Bungie if that did not happen. It is now painfully obvious. One, why it was purchased, and it's clear that they got out like bandits because they should not have been worth that much money. So they, f I don't know how they did it. I don't know how they could hide the, how much trouble they were in. But I would argue they're probably worth half of that. You probably could have got half of that for them because they had no choice to sell. And that price, $3.6 billion, is not a you have no choice but to accept this. That is a we were at the negotiation tables and we got out pretty well. I would say even very well for what they were. All they had was their client, their their clientele, right? Their their ongoing Destiny population. They owned Destiny the IP. That's it, right? Of course, you get their talent, which you could argue is a lot of money because there are talent. There's a lot of talented people. For as much as Christopher Barrett clearly is a weirdo, he is a very talented director that has sullied his career now. But needless to say, um, he was still talented. There is a lot of talent at its studio. Um, they have bled a lot of them because of all of this, and they have. They, I, I, I'm curious what Bungie looks like in five years, in ten years. What do they look like? Do they still have eight hundred something or a thousand people with them? Do they still have this many people there? Are they still running that heavily? Who knows? But I think it's interesting to think about. And I think it is clear that Sony made a giant error in purchasing them. Giant error, and I don't think that's. I don't think that's wise to say. It's just obvious at this point. Next story, Concord is out. This is, of course, the first game from Sony's owned first party, Firewalk. And it has completely failed in every metric. Just by going to the Steam Concurrence for the player count at launch, they were barely hitting 700 players active at a time. That is astonishing. It's incredibly low. Of course, more players may be playing on PlayStation, but even if we times that number by 10... It is still a massive failure for Sony's first own outing into the games as a service and here shooter genre. Seemingly the first time in quite some time we have an example of a monumental failure in a Sony first party release. Unbelievable, this isn't even what compelled me to write up this story as we have confirmation that this title took an eye-watering eight years to make, which is unacceptable for a title that looks like this and performs like this, frankly. To quickly quote the source, John Wis Wisniewski, the lead character designer for the game, tweeted out the following, quote, Today, Firework Studios launched Concord. The game has been in development for around eight years, and I've been there for almost five of them. We don't get a lot of launch days in our careers, so today is a special one for a ton of reasons. Oblige me some good vibes today, end quote. Founded in 2018 and then purchased by Sony in April of 2023, this game marks the studio's first release, since they are founding. This is what I mentioned earlier where I wanted to sit down and really discuss Concord. And wow, this is... It's, it lacks words of describing. I'm, sh I'm shocked that Sony would, one, release to such a low fanfare. You think of Sony as someone who really does put for lack of a better word, quality first. You can even say that, and, and you can maybe say one example of that not being the case is Days Gone, uh, where that was riddled with bugs at launch. But aside from that, I've, I've, you know, you you're hard pressed to find an example of Sony first party not really hitting the ball so so badly like this. But it is, it is insane that this this game might have sold barely 50,000 units. That is horrifying to say the least, especially when you consider Sony bought this team, has been funding this team for 5 years. Um, right? Not 5 years, I apologize. They bought them last year. I forgot about this. They bought them last year, so they've been funding them for a year. And this is what they have to show for it. This is this is sad. This is sad for multiple reasons. One, does Fire, Firewalk exist after this, right? Because this game has failed. 
Um, this game has failed. It's in. It's very rare that you get to fix that, right? We can look at a couple examples where the studio sat down and they fixed it, right? You can think of No Man's Sky as a perfect example of something like that, right? Still with Sony, they were a second party. Of course, they were not owned, but that was in a related situation where a um, a, so, a close Sony title was completely and utterly botched with its release. It had a ton of massive massive negative press around the game a bunch of accusations of them lying etc so i mean you could there's whole videos about what happened with no man's sky but that's an example of of sitting down putting your nose to the grindstone and actually working and, and fixing the game and now you look at no man's sky people don't even remember how it launched people don't even care it is a giant giant free um not free game i'm i apologize it, uh, it is a giant example of how to fix a horrible launch where everything was put against you. And they went on the other side. I would say a major success. A major success and a perfect example of something like that. I think you can also look at Cyberpunk 2077. That is a much bigger studio, of course, with CG Project Red. But you can look at that as a giant success story as well. Now, it took them four years to make an acceptable game. But they were able to do it. And they did it. And they did it by sitting down and doing the work. So I'm not trying to disparage the people at Firework. I'm not trying to say that they are uh, destined to fail or they should lose their jobs. But it is hard to see a way forward in a games as a service title like this. It is very rare that a games as a service title comes back from this, I would say. I would love to hear an example um, out there if you know of one. Uh, I can think of maybe... Oh, God. Um, something that failed... And then it got better with time. Final Fantasy XIV is a good example of that, I would say. That's a little different. That's an MMO. Um, it launched disastrously. It launched so bad that they unlaunched the game. Let's not forget that. And then relaunched it almost like a year later or something like that. And it's now seen as one of the best <coughs> excuse me, MMOs ever made. So it, this is not unheard of. But when you read concurrent steams of peaking at 700 at launch day when you assume it sold better on playstation but even if you times it by 100 right you you it's that's nothing i mean it's it's a it is an embarrassing showing i feel very bad for both um the people at sony the fans of the game and the people who made the game i i'm curious if firework exists after a while what will they do with this title i frankly is a very interesting question that needs to be answered now do they stick with it does sony say hey this is part of the game this is part of games as a service you treat it like an updatable game that you'll constantly morph and change this is the bad one but hey maybe in two years we have something that we're proud of i'm not sure that doesn't sound like the Sony I know, but maybe this is seen as different. Um, I would say, so let's not forget, this is a $40 title. Everything else is free to play in this genre. I, I see people saying this should have been free to play. I would maybe agree if Helldivers wasn't right there. Like just Helldivers just launched at the same price point. I believe it was also $40. Um, and I think a, like a special edition was like 60 But they just did this and was a massive success. Of course, on PC, much bigger than PlayStation, but Helldivers was right there. I do find it interesting that everyone's quick to make, say make it free to play. I really don't think the price price is the problem. Pricing does not keep people from buying these games that we have seen that over and over again let's not forget the original one overwatch released of course in a vastly different time before fortnite and all these things were giant but that released as a 60 dollars game yes like th there's examples of these games are launching and having a paid pay in to play and where success is i really don't think the problem is free to play i think you can make a hybrid free to play that would maybe be wise you adapt maybe a league of legend uh, perspective on this and say hey uh, we're gonna have a rotating weekly set of heroes you'll be able to play th uh, three of them always and then two of them as a rotate rotation so there'll always be five players you can play as and then two of them will rotate every week and you could try it out and if you like it you can play it and maybe you have a max of I don't know, 40 hours a week to play or something. I don't know. Maybe there's no time limit or something, but 
that's just an example of how you can maybe utilize this into uh, getting more people to play it because it, I really don't think the price is the problem. Everyone's saying, hey, make it free to play. Hey, make play. I want to return to paying for our games, please. So we stop seeing skins that are $20, the skins that are $25 backpacks that are 15 bucks they, they, we have got to in a, a, a gross level of monetization in video games because they feel like they have to be free to play i do not want to end up like phone games go look at the apple app store if you want examples of what can happen if people get used to not paying for things i don't want that situation here we already have adapted horrible horrible practices of the mobile store right let's not forget we did not have loot boxes we did not have any of these things before the app store blew up and yet we incorporated all of the bad annoying anti-consumer aspects of the app store while doing none of the good right although there's very few good frankly for me but anyways it's very frustrating and it is very old clearly people are over the, the this games as a service thing or at least the way that they pursued it there over uh, we we'll see if they're really over it marvel rivals seems to be an interesting game that's coming out very soon that is a hero shooter but it is free to play so maybe people will find it Ooh, excuse me i had to yawn uh maybe people will find that more enjoyable maybe the, maybe the hero shooter being more literal um will, will be more enjoyable for them i'm not really sure we'll have to see but I, I, I'm so fascinated what's going to happen because not only are we seeing Sony's first outing into a games as a service, we're seeing how they handle a failure. We have not been able to see that in a long time from a first party studio. What does Sony do when they fail now? We've seen what they do when they succeed. They make better and better games. What happens when they fail? That's, that's a fascinating thought process. I'll be watching this with close eyes. How do they react with Concord? Do they make it free to play? Do they refund everybody? I mean, you could easily refund everyone. Let's what? Let's say fifty thousand people bought this game. Forty dollars uh, times fifty. It's, it, that's pennies, uh, pennies to Sony. That's nothing to them. That that is they 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 they, uh, they quite literally piss that away. So you could easily return that. Make goodwill. Everyone who bought the game, give them some sort of free skin package or something like this nature uh, with the refund and say, hey, we apologize. We're going to switch to a freely play model. Maybe they do that in two months. I'm not really sure, but um, I don't know where it, it's it's not like the game didn't sell well. The game sold. Some of the worst Sony's ever seen. Especially modern Sony. There's a lot of people there that probably don't even know what it feels like not to do good on something. They've been doing goods for so long, right? So let's see what happens when Sony has an actual obstacle in their path and they have to figure something out. I'm excited. We'll have to see. Thank you. Oh, I mean, uh, I get myself amped up. We'll have to see what they do with Concord. I had no interest in this game. Every time I looked at the game, I, I got to be honest, it looked stale, bland. It looked like, it, I mean, it looked like an Overwatch clone. I, it, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not saying that's not something that should be enjoyed by other people. Of course, I'm not saying that. Everyone listening to the show I know knows that. But to see it played and and to see how the dynamic worked, it was not doing it for me. Moving on. Indiana Jones releasing December 9th, 2024. For Xbox Series X and X, Windows PC and Steam, of course, available day one on Game Pass. Now, why am I saying this in uh, the start of the show? Well, something quite interesting happened in their review. Something strange happened when we learned of the release date um, at these um, opening night live. The last thing, which is what you know, you call the last thing when, when everything has been shown. You're like, oh, there's one more thing to say. The last thing that was shown about this game after the release date, after all the hype. Simply PS5 in spring 2025, which is so telling for so many reasons, right? A marquee title recently purchased by Xbox Bethesda is, is releasing a giant title in the Indiana Jones world, right? Made by Machine Games, acclaimed FPS studio developer, Machine Games. They release Indiana Jones 
and they're very quick to not even announce it bef- after the game comes out. It's many months before the game comes out that it will be coming to PS5. That is shocking, and it is very telling. I want I want everyone to do a little exercise with me. Why would you do this, right? What would incentivize someone who is selling a game on their platform via a subscription service or a la carte? They want you to buy it on Xbox or PC. They don't really care either way, technically, I guess. Because they get their cut either way. They just get a, a cut differently if it's on Xbox. But let, but why would you do that, right? Let's get in the head of an executive at Microsoft. Why would you announce a PlayStation date the moment you announce everything else? Well, to me, it's frankly obvious. They don't see a huge influx of sales on their platform right so they don't care about announcing a new platform right now because they don't care about selling the game on their platform they care about coming to xbox on their platform right but that's strange though right if you only cared about the subscription service then why even sell it on another platform at all and i think we can follow this logic and arrive somewhere that is interesting so we find that they announce this at the same time, right? We know that they don't care about sales because why would they announce that it will be coming to a rival platform very soon after launch? You would save that. There is no reason, if you care about sales on your console, to announce that it is coming to a rival console at the same time, right? So we have to conclude that there is no inkling of care of sale on their console. They do not care about units sold. They care about you knowing that there is a game on Game Pass that you can buy right now. And all you got to do is pay, I don't know, 15 bucks, 20 bucks a month. And you can play Indiana Jones right now. Or you can wait a couple months, buy it at $70. We get 30% of that. Or sorry, we get 70% of that. Plus PlayStation, of course, takes a 30% cut on the game because it is on their platform. You get 70% of that. And you're good then. So you're giving a consumer a choice, I guess, right? And it's a little more obvious. And this is actually where I thought they would do with Call of Duty, although they are uh, technically, but this seems even more cut and dry than the Call of Duty situation, right? Hey, Xbox is going to get all this stuff early, but you can wait and get it on PlayStation because, frankly, we don't care about selling these units anymore. We just want people to know that if you want all these games at once, you just pay Game Pass on an Xbox or a, place, or a PC, and you come over here and play it. Let's not forget Game Pass ha- is seen as majorly behind, right? Um, we know that from the FTC leaks many uh, moons ago now that they thought they would be at, I want to say, like, what is it, like 35 million subscribers? Some some massive number that they're nowhere close. I think they're like 10 million uh, subscribers behind or so, something of that nature. Obviously, we don't have up-to-date numbers, and there's a lot of guessing in these things um, uh, to get to that number. And also, let's not forget, they're kind of cheating with their numbers right now. Uh, they did change Xbox Live Gold to just being Game Pass, so now they can say, hey, we have a lot of Game Pass members. You don't. You have Xbox Live Gold members, but you changed the definition, so now you can't say that it's Game Pass members but that's that's a lie technically because you changed the definition you didn't really get more subscribers it's just unimportant but important to point out i just found it fascinating that not only did they announce the ps5 one they announced it at the same time that they announced the dates for all other platforms meaning the only logical conclusion that you can come to is they don't care if they sell any units on their platform at all. They just want you to know it's on Game Pass. And that's it. And I think that's not wise, to say the least. Date updates. That's the show for the week. Let's get into the date updates. So we get in 1 and 2 HD Remaster, Gate Rune, and Dunan Unification Wars added PS5 and Xbox Series versions to their expected releases. And they also announced a date of March 6, 2025. I'm going to be foaming at the mouth when this thing comes out. I want everyone to understand that they're going to be dealing with such a disgusting, off-putting human when this comes out. Uh, I hope everyone's ready uh, to be annoyed 
and a little bit turned on, let's be honest. Foam Stars will be going free to play on October 4th. Yes, Foam Stars, that game you definitely forgot about and didn't even know existed anymore. Foam Stars, yes. Going free to play October 4th. Capcom Finding Collection 2 announced for PS4, Switch, and PC out 2025. The collection has all of the games that I'm about to list right now. <clears throat> Capcom vs. SNK Millennium Fight 2000 Pro. Capcom vs. SNK 2 Mark of the Millennium 2001. Capcom Fighting Evolution. Street Fighter 3 Upper. Project Justice. Power Stone. Power Stone 2. Plasma Sword. Nightmare of Bilstein. A terrible name. PlayStation Plus games for September are the following. You'll be able to get this next day as of publishing of this video. Harry Potter Quidditch Champions. MLB The Show 2024. Little Nightmares 2. These are all three PS4 and PS5 games. So PlayStation Plus members enjoy those. I will be trying out Harry Potter Quidditch Champions, of course, to see if I like it. The other two, not very interesting to me, I must admit. Konami has released Castlevania Dominus Collection. It's the latest compilation of classic Castlevania games. These are all DS games that are put in a collection, and I'm very excited about them. The following games are Castlevania Dawn of Sorrow, Castlevania Portrait of Ruin, Castlevania Order of... What does that say? Esselia? <laughs> I never played that one. Uh, Esselia. I played Portrait of Ruin a little bit. I played a lot of Dawn of Sorrow. Two bonus titles are also added. The original arcade version of Castlevania called Haunted Castle. I bet none of you even knew that existed. And a reimagined version of Haunted Castle Revisited. The collection is available now. Switch, PS5, Xbox Series, SNX, and Steam. Excuse me. It's available for $24.99 USD. Now that really is the show for the week. The... Data updates is done. Start of the show. Rapid fire. It's all done. So let's get into what's queued for the weekend. That's what's queued for the week. Now, this is, of course, a question I ask myself. But, of course, you at home, what do you have queued up for the week? This could be a game, movie, TV show, book, comic book, audiobook. Frankly, anything. What do you have queued up for the week? I want to relay some quick information about this, the, the show while I have you here. End of the show. This is when it, <coughs> only the hardcore are listening anyways. We have some visitors coming soon. Emmett Watkins Jr. is I'm going to be getting back onto the show. Friends from Podcast PSN, I'm going to get them on as soon as I can. Unannounced people, I will be teasing later when I have full confirmation on dates. Very excited for very many reasons. I will relate to you that much sooner. Other than that, I want to thank everyone for listening to the show. Let's get back into what's queued up, and then we're going to have this tied up in a nice little blow. Um, blow? Floridian Swip, I think. Anyways, what's queued up for the week? I think I'm going to play Star Wars. Because I, I need to buy this game. Try it out. Is that all I have queued up for the week? That's not true. What else do I have? I don't really have much this week. I, I, I've, 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 I've been so busy with life. Doing things. Having fun. Been going to the gym recently. I don't even think I've said that on the show. I feel, I'm feeling great, frankly. But I don't know. I don't, I don't really have anything queued up. There's a couple comic books I actually want to read. Um, and there's a book. Um, I think I do. I have it on my shelf near me. I don't think I do. Um, and, there, and there's another book I need to read. X-Men Hellfire Gala. That I'm going to be reading soon. I mean, I have so many books that I'm behind on. So I want to take some time. Read some books. I've taken a semi hiatus on gaming for a little while. Because I'm just enjoying life and the many other entertainment sources that we have. So I think I'm going to do a little bit of that. I don't think I'm going to go crazy with anything else for right now. But anyways, I wanted to thank everyone for joining me today. This has been a great episode, a nice meaty hour plus episode of these Shavers Game Podcast. I want to thank everyone. I want to say, I hope you enjoy the rest of your week. I hope this video found you well. I hope, uh, I don't know. Eat some broccoli or something. Eat some greens, right? We all need greens. I have, I don't eat enough greens. I feel like, like, and when I say greens, I mean like the super greens, your broccolis, your kales, your spinaches, the, the highs and magnesiums and irons and such. But I do love peas. I think that was important. It's important to say 
I love peas, and I don't know why. That that's like the that's the green of choice. And I know they're not that good for you, so it's not like I'm eating like some sort of super green. I know I understand that, but it's very good. But I need to get back into the kale spinach grind. I feel like I really miss. You know what I miss? Spinach, egg, bacon. Breakfast of Champions fuse you for hours. You could do you could do like track after that. <laughs> what am I saying? <clears throat> I need to get out of here. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have a good rest of your week. Stay tuned for some new show ideas very soon. There will be some new things percolating through the show. A couple tests, a couple mainstays, a couple permanents. And until next time. Go Chief.